a presentation to the Joint Select Committee on the Constitution Amendment Tobago Self-Government Bill 2018 by Dr. Rita Pemberton, 17th May 2018. The Parliament's Joint Select Committee on the Constitution Amendment Tobago Self-Government Bill 2018 is meeting with stakeholders in an effort to formulate revised legislation which will have the widest support from the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Rita Pemberton is a senior lecturer in history at the University of the West Indies St. Augustine campus and on May 17th, she made a presentation to the Committee on the History of Tobago's Relationship with Trinidad. So, where the Union of Trinidad and Tobago is concerned, what I have done is to indicate that it was a long-standing process and it didn't just occur out of the hatch in the 19th century. And I identify three forces which led to this union. One, a failed plantation economy in Tobago. Two, the challenges posed in and by Tobago. And three, imperial policies. So when we go through those, what we are in fact doing is looking at the history of Tobago in 45 minutes. So what I've done to try to make it simpler is to look at the origins, the long-term factors, that led to this road to union, then the immediate causes and responses. Responses I look at because responses um, extend from the period of the union right down to present, present day. And then I will offer some concluding remarks. So I begin with the failed plantation economy. I describe the Tobago plantation economy as failed from the start mm -hmm. because it emerged at a time when there was significant competition for the island. And in the process of that competition, what happened is I grab and I destroy. Then you grab and you destroy. So there was a certain uncertainty about ownership at the end of the 19th century. In 1763, it was declared a British possession, but the French still had its eyes on it. But what the British did, because the competition was still hot, what the British did was to try to make its presence felt as quickly as possible as a defense measure. So they quickly subdivided the land, sold out to interested plantation, uh, potential plantation owners, and established a government. And so this, they hoped, will um, establish their firm and permanent hold on the territory. And then with the plantations came uh, an enslaved population, which gave them, they thought, uh, a greater defense uh, mechanism. But before the plantations were five years old, in fact, the new plantations were three years old when the first set of slave revolts occurred. And therefore, the footing of the plantation sector was very, very insecure. So you had those, those uh, revolts to deal with. You had also the conflicts with the indigenous population. And those planters who had initially invested, some of them decided to get out of the business. They were disappointed. Many came into the thing expecting quick profits, which did not materialize. And then in 1781, the French grabbed the island again. So now you have a French occupation with a British plantation population. And in those days, it was important that you, you give signal to your allegiance to the ruling nation by swearing oath. And those who refused to do that were expelled. So some people would have taken loans, um, bought property in Tobago, and then now they're expelled, but they're still owing in England. Then the, the French government refused to allow trade with Britain. So those who had managed to produce on their estates could not sell to England to pay their debts in England. So that, was, that remained hanging over their heads. The French also in, introduced very new taxes and very heavy taxes. So you have to pay to the French government from what you managed to sell and you didn't have any means to, to pay off mortgages that you had with the British. 
Then you had the Revolutionary Wars. The French Re Revolution and the American Revolution, they were both very, very disturbing to plantation operations, and particularly so to new plantation operations. So it was the end of cheap supplies, food and supplies, and plantation material, and therefore the operation, operating costs in Tobago skyrocketed because this is, they are still new. This is a new plantation operation here. So by the end of the century, 1763 to, to the end of the century, there's still no stability. 1793, the British takes back the island and reverses the French policies. And again, some plantation owners, because at this point, let me cut my losses and get out. And so plantation change hands. And I think that the frequency of changing hands is something we will see right through the history of Tobago through the 19th, throughout, throughout the 19th century. And that was uh, clearly a signal that the, the, the operation was not stable. And then in 1802, it's gone back to France. So you have the same cycle restarting, and in 1803, it's back to Britain. And so it's total chaos in, in Tobago. But now it is, it's, it's declared a, a British colony, and France has given up. But when it becomes British, other things are happening. Plantation owners at that time wanted enslaved labor. But Britain was in the throes of the abolition movement already. So then it said that these new territories, Tobago being one of them, would have limited um, enslaves permitted on the territory. So the Limitation Act said that you couldn't um, pass a certain number, and then the Abolition Act in 1808 totally stopped. Planters in Tobago, you know, they grumbled and they begged for consideration, no avail. So what happens? The price of enslaved labor increased, the cost of essential items increased, market conditions at the beginning of the 19th century were unfavorable because other producers came on board, Trinidad being one, and producing far more than Tobago could. So planters, some planters were in the, in the red, and then you have another wave of sales of plantations. So the 19th century, produces challenges. So we start off with all those um, changes, and then by 1834, we have emancipation. So now when you have emancipation, you have now a population that nobody considered in anything that had happened in the island up to that point. So you have the freed Africans, and they are now looking to own land. And I put that in bold because I will make a reference to it later because it was something of, of greater importance, more than just simply owning land. So from after 1838, you had more frequent changes of ownerships. And certainly at the start, after the end of abolition, and then you have um, after emancipation, and then later on in the century from the 1880s when other forces became operative. So in the 19th century, what we have, uh, the demise of the plantation sector, evident by the end of the 19th century. Uh, because of post-emancipation conflicts between workers and employers, um, labor problems, planters said they were short. They kept begging for permission to bring in immigrants and so forth. But the real problem is that they didn't really want to negotiate with their workers in terms other than those similar to enslavement. And then the British government passed the Sugar Duties Act, which removed the protection uh, Caribbean, British Caribbean sugar enjoyed in the British market. So now they had to compete with everybody else. And Tobago's production just couldn't stand up to that competition. It was terribly old-fashioned. Uh, the, the planters didn't have money to invest. They couldn't attract investors either. And so they were cultivated and, and manufacturing sugar in the old-fashioned way. Everybody had a... a a series of boilers and everything to produce, so each estate continued to produce its own sugar in a time when people were moving to um, collaborating and, and having more communal operations. Then the hurricane of 1847 hit, and the British government um, was not anxious to give a lot of assistance, uh, and so people weren't getting money 
to, they were getting money, planters were getting money to rebuild, but they weren't getting money to improve their services. So they couldn't modernize, and Tobago sugar was simply even less competitive after that. Planters again requested permission to bring in immigrants, and again the response was no, so they turned to methodage, which was a system of sharecropping. You can't bring in people from outside, so you use what's there and we will share the, the returns, profit or loss. But the sharing did not go the way that people expected. The planters grumbled that the materials were not devoting themselves to sugar. The materials used the opportunity in the sugar banks to plant some cassava, potato, and other things to sustain themselves. Um, the planters didn't have cash to pay, and what they would do is to pay in, in kind, and it would usually be give access to plantation land so you could work it. Now that sounds very good, except you fell out with the planter, because if you did, then he will say, get off my land. But your payment is still there. You, you, you haven't reaped what you planted on the plot you got in, as payment for the last job you did for him. So that created a whole cauldron of confusion. Planters still unable to get credit, so some try to get their properties sold in London, a uh, heavy spate of advertisement of Tobago properties for sale. Matayaj. This was a system where plantation owner would engage a number of workers and you would work for me, so I, pro I provide you the land and I provide the buildings through which the whole process of, of, of making sugar would pass. And in return, you would give me your labor, so you will plant, you will cut, and you will put the boil and put it through the whole process. But when it became, or that, that was the standard, and it was agreed what percentage of the return you would get. For some, it was 50-50, some it was 60-40, but many of them said the sharing was not honored in the way they expected. So just as an example, one, they said that the planters would say the sharing didn't include rum if it was made on the estate on molasses. So they're sharing only between some sugar, but rum and molasses were the items that attracted the highest prices. And then where the molasses were shared or where the sugar was shared, you would say, okay, um, if this is the measure, one for me, one for you. One for me, one for you. Two for me, one for you. Three for me. And so they quarreled because they thought that the returns were not what they expected. They had a sense. I mean, when you produce, you have a sense of how much you should get, and it was not fair. So that caused endless conflict. So although matters spread all over the island, and in some in, in some books, it suggests that it works so very well. Uh, it was discovered later that uh, there were a lot of conflicts. It's just that the legal proce procedures were so complicated and expensive that they could not even bother to go to court. They had, it made no sense. So to my mind, the whole demise of the plantation sector resulted from that experience. Now we can look at British imperial policy, which I identified as one of the factors. The British government had always been cautious. A new colony, a new island was, was, was being settled by Englishmen and they will stay back. And you say, you, you face the music, you put out the money, we're not putting out anything until we are sure. So with their focus on profits, what would benefit them, and if it is something that would get, get at their enemies, fine, they will give you support from the background. What they did not want with any colony is that they had to expend themselves too much to maintain an administrative bureaucracy. So Tobago was always placed in a union of some kind. And um, this was a cost reduction measure and part of the uncertainty too. So it was in, at, from 1763 it was part of the governorate in Grenada. But at that time, the planters in Tobago asked for and were granted their own self-governing uh, apparatus. So therefore, the, the union was not one that bound anybody to anybody else. And then again in 1833, 
it is, it's part of the Windmill Islands group with the, with the government in Barbados. And the whole idea there is that you're paying one governor other than having to pay a governor for each individual unit. And you would have a lieutenant governor administer the individual islands. 1877, it was made a crown colony, partly in response to the Belmano riots and, and, and the growing concern about what these free African people are going to do and what their presence meant for the politics of the place. And then 1885, as we get down to the, the era of, of serious sugar depression, uh, Tobago is placed under the Windward Islands government with, um, where the seat of government was in Grenada. And then 1889, again, dealing with the problem of, of lack of finances is unified with Trinidad. And to all this, there's no consideration for what people felt in Tobago and the different groups who operated in Tobago. So Britain was moved by its own economic and other circumstances. Britain was going through a period of... of, of um, economic challenges as well in the middle of the 19th century. 1846, it passed the Sugar Duties Act, which removed the protection. And it did that at a time when colonies were struggling. So it wasn't about colonies, it was about Britain and the fact that it was becoming industrialized and it wanted wider markets. And these um, colonies with freed Africans did not offer uh, a serious market. And so what they did then after that was to look at the administrative costs and they just announce that we are not, the Crown is not going to pay your governors and lieutenant governors, you have to pay. So you are asked to pay at the time when your costs, your, your, your revenues are, are falling. So their cost-cutting measures were implemented um, as the plantation economy went into greater and greater crisis and could not meet their administrative costs. And as a result of that, they are begging Britain for more money. So what they did, they reduced salaries. They combined offices. And sometimes the combined positions went across territories. So uh, in Tobago, for example, there was an administrator for, for works, a supervisor of works, and he was based in St. Lucia. So you can imagine what the works in Tobago would have. Then they reduced the number of administrators. They removed the lieutenant governor so he didn't have to pay that salary and put the island in charge of an administrator, which was lesser paying job. And so the, the colony had to find from its revenue money to meet, pay these officers. So there was a serious economic crisis in Tobago at the end of the, the century. And governors started making recommendations. So 1872, a governor is recommended some kind of unification of the territories. 1878, a governor of Tobago, he was very distressed and he suggested union with Trinidad. The large planters, of course, having had a tradition of, of self-rule through the House of Assembly, they oppose. Um, and then the British government restated their position that they're not paying, you have to pay. So the, the revenues falling, cost of administration for the Tobago public has increased. The governor imposes an export tax as a, a means to raise revenue, and the planters vehemently opposed. And then in 1886, Governor, Sendal, governor Robinson wrote to uh, Governor Sendal about unifying Tobago and Trinidad, and his arguments were that this would provide economic and administrative efficiency. But with all that talk, the depression worsened in the 1880s. Tobago was borrowing money. It borrowed from merchants in Grenada to meet its recurrent expenditure. Um, all the increased taxes and the cuts and the retrenchment and the combination of posts and all those other measures uh, didn't make a difference. And so what we had was a large rate of estate abandonment. Now, this estate abandonment is significant for two reasons. One, it means that the white presence on the island would be reduced, further reduced, because it was never very large. And that had implications for who would be the persons sitting as representatives in the, representative, the bodies that administered the island. And the black population was becoming landowners by all these estate abandonments. 
you had opportunities for black. So the Tobago history is very different to the rest of the Caribbean, and certain to Trinidad, because black people were able to own land and not just marginal land. You abandon an estate, the government will eventually break it up and sell it so people could buy land in Tobago West, right? Not just in the hills of Charlotte, Willow Space, I don't anywhere else. So the British didn't know what to do, so the usual thing, they set up the, this commission, the Crossman Commission, and to inquire in the finances, well, it's more to inquire into their lack of finances. And they found that the taxation was extremely heavy in Tobago and it was placed squarely on the backs of the masses. And little was done in terms of infrastructure. And so the island's infrastructure was in very poor shape and the officials were very poorly paid. And what that commission recommended was a federation with headquarters at Grenada. So in the official circles, the answer to the economic problems was a federation or union of some kind. And then, with the crash of Gillespie and Company, that was the main body in England that provided any services at all to Tobago estates, and because they had an interest in 19 estates on the island. They gave credit, they provided shipping and marketing for what sugar was produced. And this, at the same time of the crash, there was a drought on the island, so the amount of sugar was re reduced, so things didn't look good. More Estates were abandoned, and the Crown had to sell more land because these abandoned estates fell in the hands of the Crown. So you have this growth of the class of black landowners. Some of them bought entire estates. So now you have a serious problem here. You have black plantation owners, so they would qualify for the vote. But that's not good. That's not good in the eyes of the traditional white elite. The answer to the crisis then was through politics. Federation proposed, federation opposed. Resistance, and there was a resistance that started in the expressions of the white or the remnants of the white ruling class. And when Tobago was put in that federation, there was much grumbling from the white ruling class who objected to not being a part of the whole process. The colonial office thought that Tobago would best be placed as a dependency of Trinidad. That was the language that they used. Governor Robinson informed the population that that was inevitable, the population both of Trinidad and Tobago. But he had a plan, and his plan was to let all the Tobagonians leave Tobago and go to Maruga. He said Maruga was the most profitable part of Trinidad, and he would give everybody one acre of land once he decided to go. But that didn't sell in Tobago. Nobody, nobody, um, nobody bought that. <laughs> oh, you are. <laughs> Maruga. Well, there would have been no Tobago. I mean, all the people would have been in Maruga, and Maruga would have been very interesting now. <laughs> to get rid of the problem. You see, the problem wasn't just the falling plantations, the problem was the acquisition of land by black people. White controlled, at least white controlled. But the ownership of land, in, and several of them bought whole estates. So you have this black planter community. That is not good news. I see none in the records <laughs> so far. So I, I don't know if we check in Moroga to find out if anybody there has to be the roots then that might be the answer. But I doubt it very much. <laughs> you would find the Tobago Kings in Tuko. Not down there. Yeah. So, then the British government announced annexation. So with all the discussion going on on both sides, the English not taking them on because they know exactly what they wanted. Annexation, and it was published in December 1886, is actually the 20th of December 1886. And then the ruling class is now, on both sides, they consider now who is going to handle the money. And so they're discussing and discussing again. They start the wave of talking about how is this going to work out, and they are both opposed. Now, the large Trinidad planters did not want any union. But 
the, the Tarans Tobago planters did not want any union at all. They insisted that she should have financial autonomy. They wanted guarantees that Tobago would not suffer as a result of the union. They wanted to ensure they still had a voice. And they wanted an, exp an escape clause. Should the union prove disadvantageous to Tobago, they wanted to be able to get out. Well, the British government didn't chew on that one. The answer was no. The merchants were opposed. They, f they were afraid that all the business would be centered now in Port of Spain. Everything will come through Port of Spain. Custom duties would be paid in Port of Spain, and they would not get any. The general population was afraid of Trinidad taxation, which was much higher than Tobago, as was the price of land. And they were concerned, too, that the revenue to be paid to the United Colony would support an administration which they could not afford, so, and which would not benefit them as well. But there was some hope. They hoped that in the Union, they would get improved communications, better steamer service, and better coastal, um, postal arrangements. And the plans of elite hope that if they had control of the financial, financial body, they would have a window of freedom as against just being part of a nominated body. Trinidad, they were insisting that Trinidad was not paying a cent for any matters related to Pago. <laughs> they felt that Tobago would use up resources that would be better utilized in Trinidad. Tobago's poverty would impair to be Trinidad's chance of getting credit. Tobago would be a financial burden and we not pay in Tobago's debts. So it was a dead no. Well, the imperial government, as they would always do, they gave the order. There would be no annulment facility. So Tobago wasn't getting that. So you have a choice. Either you are completely incorporated in Trinidad or you are annexed. And that was that. So the order in council was passed and Tobago became joint colony with Trinidad from 1st of January 1888. Official control of the Tobago's financial board was reduced. At the same time, however, in Trinidad, the unofficials were allowed to control the estimate and finance committee in. So that tells us what the colonial office thought about Tobago and its financial state. The agreement at 1889 keep revenues and debts separate because the Trinidad planters didn't want to have anything to do with the debts. The local government in Tobago was subordinated to that in Trinidad and that continued to be a cause of concern. And Tobago reduced the financial board with reduced powers but also with reduced revenue and out of that, Tobago lost its separate political and administrative identity. So now, 1889, we are unified. The large landowners, as were still unable to pay their taxes, their revenues declined, and so the island's revenue declined even further. Um, by 1889, there were only three distilleries operating on the island when they used to be 32. And by 1892, the administrators were announcing that Tobago was bankrupt. In the Union, the large plantation owners continued about being politically subordinated to Trinidad. They argued that Trinidad merchants gained business where Tobago lost. Customs Union diminished, and therefore the island's main source of revenue was removed. Tobago planters felt that their needs were not being attended to, and they felt that the attachment to Trinidad was disastrous. And what happened was they were making reference to the problems and, and with the operation of methage where under the union, the chief justice of Trinidad had to pay whole sessions, annual sessions in Tobago. And Justice John Gurry, a liberal, went to Tobago um, and took the cases of the poor. Uh, without charge. So he heard um, all those cases, and not only did he hear the cases without charge, 
he gave decisions in favor of the Metayers. So there was a famous case where he told the landowner, well, the, the, the Metayer has been working on this land long enough, and it is his. So planters were up in arms, and there was a move to get rid of him, both in Tobago and in Trinidad, because he was doing the same thing in Trinidad with respect to the, the indentured workers. So um, they described the experience as um, disastrous. They continued to ask for aid to import immigrants. And what happened was the lower class in, in Tobago benefited from the union in that they could move to, to, to Trinidad, sell their stuff, get better prices. They could work. They were, there was a scheme carrying workers to Toko. They could work and earn more money than they would get paid in Tobago. And so they started a petition for closer union with Trinidad. And this is exactly what the imperial government wanted. The ruling class was angry. The colonial office took advantage of this. And um, the, although the Tobago unofficial sent a memo asking for severance to the union, so you had these two, two petitions, one asking for closer and one asking to get out. And the administrators found themselves in difficulties operating within the union. There were many conflicts, and whatever the administrator thought, what measures he would utilize, for example, one of them was Crown Land. Trinidad didn't like the Crown Land policy, um, policy at all because it meant more people were being able to buy land cheaper, and they didn't like that. Trinidad planters uh, contained you know, the, 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 the land business and kept it under the control of the large planters. And what, what the administrator was doing, administrator law was doing, was saying, well, if you wanted to buy the land in Tobago, you could pay for it in installments. If you didn't have all the, 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 five, the five pounds for it, you could pay what, you, and Trinidad didn't want that at all. So there was opposition on both sides of the fence. But since there was this petition asking for closer union, the British Union government used that as the basis for bringing this new order on the 28th of October, um, establishing closer union, um, but giving Tobago ward status. Um, it was represented in the, the council by the commissioner and one member. And um, within months, the planters were clamoring for an increased number of representation that they should have two members. And at the same time, they were asking for improved roads and services on the island. As it operated, Tobago's influence was minimal. There was little knowledge of and interest in the affairs of Tobago. There was little provision for Tobago to make any impact on decision making in Trinidad. And during the years 1913 and 1925, Tobago had no representative, but on the legislative council. But before that, the representatives from Tobago had a serious problem. Sometimes it took two weeks to get from Tobago to Trinidad. And sometimes there was no boat service at all. And, and um, when the people came down, there was no provision for their accommodation and so on. So it was a very difficult period. Uh, Tobago felt treated as a backward dependent, as backward and inferior people. To be Trinidad, Tobagodians or Trinidadians as contemptuous, uninterested, and they used to call them tricky daddians. The relation, tricky daddians. <laughs> <laughs> you mean the tricky audience? <laughs> a very tense relationship developed um, across the period uh, 1925 onwards. And this relationship threatened the Tobago identity and the calls for autonomy. Our representative James Bickard and APD James when they address the legislative council, people will laugh and dismiss their concerns. And um, that did not help the relationship. The independence constitution came, and it did not heed uh, the calls on Tobago for uh, better representation and, and greater participation, some self-rule. And when these surged in 1970 with the Black Power and E.N.R. Robinson, um, Eric Williams fallout, then the matter was brought to Parliament, 
And so in 1980, you had a recreation of the Tobago House of Assembly. Then after that, it dissatisfaction with its li limited powers, frustration, tense relations all over again, amendments 1996, and still we're not happy with the state of affairs. So there continue to be a call for effective autonomy, and this is where we are at this point. So what I conclude, the road to union was laid from the earliest years of British occupation of Tobago. The plantation economy was established on very rocky ground, uh, which led to revenue deficits and an in, and inability to meet the costs of government. Imperial concern to cut costs led to the decision to yoke Tobago and Trinidad together, largely because um, it was felt, one, the proximity, two, it was hoped that to Trinidad, which is, which is surging uh, economy, would be able to infuse some into Tobago, that they would buy land and, 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 and um, establish successful operations. <coughs> Excuse me. Ironically, at that time, they didn't want Tobago land. That desire came uh, in the more modern period. Now you have to say, well, look, look, um, we need some for ourselves too. So uh, the planting class, no, the decision was top down. Nobody asked um, what anybody wanted. Nobody considered the nature of the population, uh, the interests of all the groups. And the planter class, however, was not the only group that was deprived of its political voice at the union. And I said that the new land owners, when they sought land, they were not looking only at economic in independence. They wanted a chance to participate in political decision making, which came with land ownership. But the British government, this was exactly what they wanted to avoid. And so by the implementation of Crown Colony government first, and by the union subsequently with Trinidad, the black Tobago landowning population was in fact deprived of a chance to participate meaningfully in political decision making with respect to the unified territory. And so while as a, Tobago was seen as, uh, Trinidad was seen as uncaring and imperialistic, Tobago's concerns were not taken seriously. And so the responses and the experiences in the union made self-rule, you know, continue to be a part of the Tobago psyche. Tobago. What do you think should be the relationship between Tobago and Trinidad? The Joint Select Committee of Parliament on the Constitution Amendment Tobago Self-Government Bill 2018 is coming to you. Come out to the Victor E. Bruce Complex at 6 to 10 Post Office Street, Scarborough on Sunday, 10th June 2018 from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. to interact with the committee. This meeting is open to the public, so come with your suggestions and questions on the Constitution Amendment Tobago Self-Government Bill 2018. We want to hear from you. The bill can be viewed on the Parliament's website at www.ttparliament.org and for more information on this meeting follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter and Instagram.